Chapter 37 of The Well at the World's End, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Well at the World's End, Book 2, by William Morris. Chapter 37, How Ralph Justed with the Aliens. Meanwhile, Captain Otter had brought Ralph into the staked-out lists, which, being hastily pitched, were but slenderly done, and now the upmeads stripling stood there beside a good horse which they had brought to him, and Otter had been speaking to him friendly. But Ralph saw the Lord come forth from the pavilion and take his seat on an ivory chair set on a turf ridge close to the stakes of the lists, for that place was used of custom for such games as they exercised in the lands of Utterbol. Then presently the ladies' women came out of their tents, and being marshalled by Agatha, went into the Queen's pavilion, whence they came forth again presently like a bed of garden flowers moving, having in the midst of them a woman so fair, and clad so gloriously, that Ralph must needs look on her, though he were some way off, and take note of her beauty. She went and sat down beside the Lord, and Ralph doubted not that it was the Queen, whom he had but glanced at when they had first made stay before the pavilion. Sooth to say, Joyce being well nigh as tall as the Queen, and as white of skin, was otherwise a far fairer woman. Now spake Otter to Ralph, I must leave thee here, lad, and go to the other side, as I am to run against thee. Said Ralph, Art thou to run first? Nay, but rather last, said Otter, they will try thee first with one of the sergeants, and if he overcome thee, then all is done, and thou art in an evil plight. Otherwise will they find another and another, and at last it will be my turn. So keep thee well, lad. Therewith he rode away, and there came to Ralph one of the sergeants, who brought him a spear and bade him to horse. So Ralph mounted and took the spear in hand, and the sergeant said, Thou art to run at whatsoever meeteth thee, when thou hast heard the third blast of the horn. Art thou ready? Yea, yea, said Ralph, but I see that the spearhead is not rebated, so that we are to play at sharps. Art thou afraid, youngling? said the sergeant, who was old and crabbed. If that be so, go and tell the Lord, but thou wilt find that he will not have his sport wholly spoiled, but will somehow make a bolt or a shaft out of thee. Said Ralph, I did but jest. I deem myself not so near my death today as I have been twice this summer or oftener. Said the sergeant, It is ill jesting in matters wherein my lord hath to do. Now thou hast heard my word, do after it. Therewith he departed, and Ralph laughed and shook the spear aloft, and it deemed it not over strong but he said to himself that the spears of the others would be much the same. Now the horn blew up thrice, and at the latest blast Ralph pricked forth as one well used to the tilt, but held his horse well in hand, and he saw a man come driving against him with his spear in the rest, and deemed him right big. But this with all he saw, that the man was ill arrayed, and was pulling on his horse as one not willing to trust him to the rush, and indeed he came on so ill that it was clear that he would never strike Ralph's shield fairly. So he swerved as they met, so that his spear-point was never near to Ralph, who turned his horse toward him a little, and caught his foeman by the gear about his neck, and spurred on, so that he dragged him clean out of his saddle, and let him drop, and rode back quietly to his place, and got off his horse to see to his girths, and he heard great laughter rising up from the ring of men, and from the women also. But the lord of Utterball cried out, "'Bring forth someone who doth not eat my meat for nothing!' and set that wretch and dastard aside till the tilting be over, and then he shall pay a little for his wasted meat and drink. Ralph got into his saddle again, and saw a very big man come forth at the other end of the lists, and wondered if he should be overthrown of him, but noted that his horse seemed not over good. Then the horn blew up, and he spurred on, and his foemen met him fairly in the midmost of the lists, yet he laid his spear but ill, and as one who would thrust and foin with it rather than letting it drive all it might, so that Ralph turned the point with his shield that it glanced off, but he himself smote the other full on the shoulder, and the shaft brake. But the point had pierced the man's armor, and the truncheon stuck in the wound. Yet, since the spear was broken, he kept his saddle. The lord cried out, Well, black Anselm, this is better done, yet art thou a big man and a well-skilled to be beaten by a stripling. So the man was helped away, and Ralph went back to his place again. Then another man was gotten to run against Ralph, and it went the same like way, for Ralph smote him amidst of the shield, and the spear held, so that he fell floundering off his horse. Six of the stoutest men of Utterball did Ralph overthrow or hurt in this wise, and then he ran three courses with Otter, 
and in the first two each break his spear fairly on the other, but in the third Otter smote not Ralph squarely, but Ralph smote full amidst of his shield, and so dight him that he well nigh fell, and could not master his horse, but yet just barely kept his saddle. Then the Lord cried out, Now make we an end of it. We have no might against this youngling man to man, or else would Otter have done it. This comes of learning a craft diligently. So Ralph got off his horse, and did off his helm, and awaited tidings. And anon comes to him the surly sergeant, and brought him a cup of wine, and said, Youngling, thou art to drink this, and then go to my lord, and I deem that thou art in favour with him. So if thou art not too great a man, thou mightest put in a word for poor redhead, that first man that did so ill. For my lord would have him set up, and head down, and buttocks aloft as a target for our bowmen, and it will be his luck if he be sped with the third shot, and last not out to the twentieth. Yea, certes, said Ralph, I will do no less, even if it anger the Lord. Oh, thou wilt not anger him, said the man, for I tell thee thou art in favour. Yea, and for me also thou mightest say a word also, when thou becomest right great, for have I not brought thee a good bowl of wine? Doubt it not, man, said Ralph, if I once get safe to Utterbol, weary on it and all its ways, said the sergeant. That is an evil wish for one who shall do well at Utterbol, but come, tarry not. So he brought Ralph to the lord, who still sat in his chair beside that fair woman, and Ralph did obeisance to him, yet he had a sidelong glance also for that fair-seeming queen, and deemed her both proud-looking and so white-skinned that she was a wonder like the queen of the fays, and it was just this that he had noted of the queen as he stood before her earlier in the day when they had first come into the vale. Therefore he had no doubt of this damsel's queenship. Now the lord spake to him, and said, well, youngling, thou hast done well, and better than thy behest, and since you have been playing at sharps, I deem thou wouldst not do ill in battle, if it came to that. So now I am like to make something other of thee than I was minded to at first, for I deem that thou art good enough to be a man, and if thou wilt now ask a boon of me, if it be not over great, I will grant it thee. Ralph put one knee to the ground, and said, Great lord, I thank thee, but whereas I am in an alien land, seeking great things, I know of no gift which I may take for myself, save leave to depart, which I deem thou wilt not grant me. Yet one thing thou mayest do for my asking, if thou wilt. If thou still be angry with the carl whom I first unhorsed, I pray thee pardon him his ill luck. Ill luck, said the lord, why I saw him that he was downright afraid of thee, and if my men are to grow blenchers and soft hearts, what is to do then? But tell me, otter, what is the name of this carl? said Otter, Redhead he hight, Lord, said the Lord, and what like a man is he in a fray? Not so ill, Lord, said Otter, this time, like the rest of us, he knew not this gear. It were scarce good to miss him at the next pinch. It were enough if he had thongs over his back a few dozen times. It will not be the first day of such cheer to him. Ha, said the Lord, and what for, Otter, what for? Because he was somewhat rough-handed, Lord, said Otter. Then shall we need him and use him some day. Let him go scot-free and do better another bout. There is thy boon granted for thee, knight, and another day thou mayest ask something more. And now shall David have a care of thee, and when we come to Utterball we shall see what is to be done with thee. Then Ralph rose up and thanked him, and David came forward and led him to his tent. And he was wheedling in his ways to him, as if Ralph were now become one who might do him great good, if so his will were. But the Lord went back again into the tower. As to the lady, she abode in her pavilion amidst many fears and desires, till Agatha entered, and said, My lady, so far all has gone happily. Said the lady, I deemed from the noise and the cry that he was doing well, but tell me, how did he? My lady, quoth Agatha, he knocked our folk about well favouredly, and seemed to think little of it. And Joyce, said the lady, how did she? She looked a queen every inch of her, and she is tall, said Agatha. Soothly some folk stared on her, but not many knew of her, since she is but new into our house. Though it is a matter of course that all save our new-come knight knew that it was not thou that sat there, and my lord was well pleased, and now he hath taken her by the hand and led her into the tower. The lady reddened and scowled, and said, And he, did he come and eye her? Oh, yea, said Agatha, whereas he stood before my lord a good while, and then kneeled to him to pray pardon for one of our men who had done ill in the tilting. Yea, he was nigh enough to touch her, had he dared, and to smell the fragrance of her raiment, and he seemed to think it good to look out of the corners of his eyes at her, 
though I do not say that she smiled on him. The lady sprang up, her cheeks burning, and walked about angrily a while, striving for words, till at last she said, When we come home to Utterball, my lord will see his new thrall again, and will care for Joyce no wit, then will I have my will of her, and she shall learn, she, whether I am verily the least of women at Utterball. Ha! what sayest thou? Now why wilt thou stand and smile on me? Yea, I know what is in thy thought, and in very sooth it is good that the dear youngling hath not seen this new thrall, this Ursula. Forsooth I tell thee that if I durst have her in my hands I would have a true tale out of her as to why she weareth ever that pair of beads about her neck. Now, Our Lady, said Agatha, thou art marring the fairness of thy face again. I bid thee be at peace, for all shall be well, and other than thou deemest. Tell me, then, didst thou get our Lord to swear immunity for me, said the lady? Yea, he swore on the edge of the sword that thou mightest say what thou wouldst, and neither he nor any other should lay hand on thee. Good, said Agatha, then will I go to him to-morrow morning, when Joyce has gone from him. But now hold up thine heart, and keep close for these two days that we shall yet abide in Tower Dale. And trust me, this very evening I shall begin to set tidings going that shall work and grow, and shall one day rejoice thine heart. So fell the talk betwixt them. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of the Well at the World's End, Book two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book two, by William Morris. Chapter thirty eight A Friend Gives Ralph a Warning. On the morrow, Ralph wandered about the dale where he would, and none meddled with him. And as he walked east along the stream where the valley began to narrow, he saw a man sitting on the bank fishing with an angle, and when he drew near, the man turned about and saw him. Then he lays down his angling rod and rises to his feet, and stands facing Ralph, looking sheepish, with his hands hanging down by his sides. And Ralph, who was thinking of other folk, wondered what he would. So he said, Hail, good fellow, what wouldst thou? said the man. I would thank thee. What for? said Ralph. But as he looked on him, he saw that it was Redhead, whose pardon he had won of the Lord yesterday. So he held out his hand and took Redhead's, and smiled friendly on him. Redhead looked him full in the face, and though he was both big and very rough-looking, he had not altogether the look of a rascal. He said, Fair Lord, I would that I might do something for thine avail, and perchance I may but it is hard to do good deeds in hell, especially for one of its devils. Yea, is it so bad as that? said Ralph. For thee not yet, said Redhead, but it may come to it. Hearken, Lord, there is none anigh us that I can see, so I will say a word to thee at once. Later on it may be over late. Go thou not to utter bowl, whatever may betide. Yea, said Ralph, but how if I be taken thither? Quoth Redhead, I can see this, that thou art so favoured, that thou mayst go whither thou wilt about the camp, with none to hinder thee. Therefore it will be easy for thee to depart by night and cloud, or in the grey of morning, when thou comest to a good pass, whereof I will tell thee. And still I say, go thou not to utter bowl, for thou art over good to be made a devil of, like to us, and therefore thou shalt be tormented till thy life is spoilt, and by that road shalt thou be sent to heaven." "'But thou saidst even now,' said Ralph, "'that I was high in the Lord's grace.' "'Yea,' said Redhead, "'that may last till thou hast command "'to do some dastard's deed, "'and nay sayest it, as thou wilt. "'And then farewell to thee, "'for I know what my Lord meaneth for thee.' "'Yea,' said Ralph, "'and what is that?' "'said Redhead, "'He hath bought thee to give to his wife "'for a toy and a minion, "'and if she like thee, "'it will be well for a while.' But on the first occasion that serveth him, and she wearieth of thee, for she is a woman like a weathercock, he will lay hand on thee and take the manhood from thee, and let thee drift about Utterbol a mock for all men, for already at heart he hateth thee. Ralph stood pondering this word, for somehow it chimed in with the thought already in his heart. Yet how should he not go to Utterbol with the damsel abiding deliverance of him there? And yet again, if they were met there and were espied on, would not that ruin everything for her as well as for him? 
At last he said, Good fellow, this may be true, but how shall I know it for true, before I run the risk of fleeing away, instead of going on to Utterbol, whereas folk deem honour awaiteth me? Said Redhead, There is no honour at Utterbol, save for such as are unworthy of honour. But thy risk is as I say, and I shall tell thee whence I had my tale, since I love thee for thy kindness to me, and thy manliness. It was told me yester eve by a woman who is in the very privity of the Lady of Utterbol, and is well with the Lord also, and it jumpeth with mine own thought on the matter. So I bid thee beware, for what it is in me to grieve would be sore grieved wert thou cast away. Well, said Ralph, let us sit down here on the bank, and then tell me more. But go on with thine angling the while, lest any should see us. So they sat down, and Redhead did as Ralph bade. And he said, Lord, I have bidden thee to flee, but this is an ill land to flee from, and indeed there is but one pass whereby ye may well get away from this company betwixt this and Utterbol, and we shall encamp hard by it on the second day of our faring hence. Yet I must tell thee that it is no road for a dastard, for it leadeth through the forest up into the mountains. Yet such as it is, for a man bold and strong like thee, I bid thee take it, and I can see to it that leaving this company shall be easy to thee. Only thou must make up thy mind speedily, since the time draws so nigh, and when thou art come to Utterbol with all this rout, and the house full, and some one or other dogging each footstep of thine, fleeing will be another matter. Now thus it is. On that same second night not only is the wood at hand to cover thee, but I shall be the chief warder of the side of camp where thou lodgest, so that I can put thee on the road. And if I were better worth, I would say, Take me with thee. But as it is, I will not burden thee with that prayer. Yea, said Ralph, I have had one guide in this countryside, and he betrayed me. This is a matter of life and death, so I will speak out, and say, How am I to know, but that thou also art going to betray me? Redhead leapt to his feet, and roared out, What shall I say? What shall I say? By the soul of my father I am not betraying thee. May all the curses of Utterbol be sevenfold heavier on me, if I am thy traitor and dastard. Softly, lad, softly, said Ralph, lest someone should hear thee. Content thee, I must needs believe thee if thou makest so much noise about it. Then Redhead sat him down again, and for all that he was so rough and sturdy a carl, he fell a-weeping. Nay, nay, said Ralph, this is worse in all wise than the other noise. I believe thee as well as a man can, who is dealing with one who is not his close friend, and who therefore spareth truth to his friend, because of many years' use and want. Come to thyself again, and let us look at this matter square in the face, and speedily, too, lest some unfriend or busybody come on us. There now. Now, in the first place, dost thou know why I am come into this perilous and tyrannous land? said Redhead. I have heard it said that thou art on the quest of the well at the world's end. And that is but the sooth, said Ralph. Well then, quoth Redhead, there is the greatest cause for thy fleeing at the time and in the manner I have bidden thee, for there is a certain sage who dwelleth in the wildwood betwixt that place and the great mountains, and he hath so much lore concerning the mountains, yea, and the well itself, that if he will tell thee what he can tell, thou art in a fair way to end thy quest happily. What sayest thou then? Said Ralph, I see that the sage is good if I may find him, but there is another cause why I have come hither from Goldberg. What is that? said Redhead. This, said Ralph, to come to Utterbol. Heaven help us, quoth Redhead, and wherefore? Ralph said, Belike it is neither prudent nor wise to tell thee, but I do verily trust thee, so hearken. I go to Utterbol to deliver a friend from Utterbol, and this friend is a woman. Hold a minute, and this woman, as I believe, hath been of late brought to Utterbol, having been taken out of the hands of one of the men of the mountains that lie beyond Cheeping No. Redhead stared astonished and kept silence a while. Then he said, Now all the more I say, Flee, flee, flee! Doubtless the woman is there whom thou seekest, for it would take none less fair and noble than that new-come thrall to draw to her one so fair and noble as thou art. But what availeth it? If thou go to Utterbol, thou wilt destroy both her and thee. For know that we can all see that the Lord hath set his love on this damsel, 
and what better can betide if thou come to Utterbol, but that the Lord shall at once see that there is love betwixt you two, and then there will be an end of the story. How so? quoth Ralph, said Redhead. At Utterbol all do the will of the Lord of Utterbol, and he is so lustful and cruel, and so false withal, that his will shall be to torment the damsel to death, and to geld and maim thee, so that none hereafter shall know how goodly and gallant thou hast been. Redhead, quoth Ralph, much moved, though thou art in no knightly service, thou mayst understand that it is good for a friend to die with a friend. Yea, forsooth, said Redhead, if he may do no more to help than that, wouldst thou not help the damsel? Now when thou comest back from the quest of the well at the world's end, thou wilt be too mighty and glorious for the lord of Utterbol to thrust thee aside, like to an over-eager dog, and thou mayst help her then. But now I say to thee, and swear to thee, that three days after thou hast met thy beloved in Utterbol, she will be dead. I would that thou couldst ask someone else nearer to the lord than I have been. The tale would be the same as mine. Now, soothly to say it, this was even what Ralph had feared would be, and he could scarce doubt Redhead's word. So he sat there, pondering the matter a good while, and at last he said, My friend, I will trust thee with another thing. I have a mind to flee to the wildwood, and yet come to Utterbol for the damsel's deliverance. Yea, said Redhead, and how wilt thou work in the matter? Said Ralph, How would it be? if I came hither in other guise than mine own, so that I should not be known either by the damsel or her tyrants. Said Redhead, There were peril in that, yet hope also. Yea, and in one way thou mightest do it, to wit, if thou wert to find that sage and tell him thy tale. If he be of good will to thee, he might then change not thy gear only, but thy skin also, for he hath exceeding great lore. Well, said Ralph, thou mayst look upon it as certain that on that aforesaid night I will do my best to shake off this company of the tyrant and thralls, unless I hear fresh tidings, so that I must needs change my purpose. But I will ask thee to give me some token that all holds together some little time beforehand, quoth Redhead. Even so shall it be, thou shalt see me at latest on the eve of the night of thy departure, but on the night before that, if it be any wise possible." Now will I go away from thee, said Ralph, and I thank thee heartily for thine help, and deem thee my friend. And if thou think better of fleeing with me, thou wilt gladden me the more. Redhead shook his head, but spake not, and Ralph went his ways down the dale. End of chapter 38《Chapter Thirty Nine of the Well at the World's End, Book Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book Two, by William Morris. Chapter Thirty Nine The Lord of Utterbol Makes Ralph a Free Man. He went to and fro that day and the next, and none meddled with him. With Redhead he spake not again those days, but had talk with Otter and David, who were blithe enough with him. Agatha he saw not at all, nor the lady, and still deemed that the white-skinned woman whom he had seen sitting by the lord after the tilting was the queen. As for the lady, she abode in her pavilion, and whiles lay in a heap on the floor weeping, or dull and blind with grief, whiles she walked up and down mad wroth with whomsoever came in her way, even to the dealing out of stripes and blows to her women. But on the eve before the day of departure, Agatha came in to her and chid her, and bade her be merry. I have seen the Lord and told him what I would, and found it no hard matter to get him to yeasay our plot, which were hard to carry out without his good will. With all the seed that I have sowed two days or more ago is bearing fruit." so that thou mayst look to it, that whatsoever plight we may be in, we shall find a deliverer. I wot not thy meaning, quoth the lady, but I deem thou wilt now tell me what thou art planning, and give me some hope, lest I lay hands on myself. Then Agatha told her, without tarrying, what she was about doing for her, the tale of which will be seen hereafter. 
and when she had done, the lady mended her cheer and bade bring meat and drink, and was once more like a great and proud lady. On the morn of departure, when Ralph arose, David came to him and said, My lord is astir already, and would see thee for thy good. So Ralph went with David, who brought him to the tower, and there they found the lord sitting in a window, an otter stood before him, and some others of his highest folk. But beside him sat Joyce, and it seemed that he thought it naught but good to hold her hand and play with the fingers thereof, though all those great men were by, and Ralph had no thought of her but that she was the queen. So Ralph made obeisance to the Lord, and stood waiting his word. And the Lord said, We have been thinking of thee, young man, and have deemed thy lot to be somewhat of the hardest, if thou must needs be a thrall, since thou art both young and well-born, and so good a man of thine hands. Now, wilt thou be our man at Otterbol? Ralph delayed his answer a space, and looked at Otter, who seemed to him to frame a yea with his lips, as who should say, Take it. So he said, Lord, thou art good to me, yet mayst thou be better if thou wilt. Yea, man, said the Lord, knitting his brows, what shall it be? Say thy say, and be done with it. Lord, said Ralph, I pray thee to give me my choice, whether I shall go with thee to Utterbol, or forbear going. Why, lo you, said the Lord testily, and somewhat sourly, thou hast the choice. Have I not told thee that thou art free? Then Ralph knelt before him, and said, Lord, I thank thee from a full heart, in that thou wilt suffer me to depart on mine errand, for it is a great one. The scowl deepened on the Lord's face, and he turned away from Ralph, and said presently, Otter, take the knight away, and let him have all his armor and weapons, and a right good horse, and then let him do as he will, either ride with us, or depart if he will, and whither he will. And if he must needs ride into the desert, and cast himself away in the mountains, so be it. But whatever he hath a mind to, let none hinder him, but further him, rather. Hearest you? Take him with thee. Then was Ralph overflowing with thanks, but the Lord heeded him not, but looked askance at him, and sourly. And he rose up withal, and led the damsel by the hand into another chamber, and she minced in her gate, and leaned over to the Lord, and spake softly in his ear, and laughed, and he laughed in his turn, and toyed with her neck and shoulders. But the great men turned and went their ways from the tower, and Ralph went with Otter, and was full of glee, and as merry as a bird. But Otter looked on him, and said gruffly, Yea, now, thou art like a songbird, but newly let out of its cage. But I can see the string which is tied to thy leg, though thou feelest it not. Why, what now? quoth Ralph, making as though he were astonished. Hearken said Otter, there is none nigh us, so I will speak straight out, for I love thee since the justing, when we tried our might together. If thou deemest that thou art verily free, ride off on the backward road when we go forward. I warrant me thou shalt presently meet with an adventure, and be brought in a captive for the second time. How then, said Ralph, hath not the Lord good will toward me? Said Otter, I say not that he is now minded to do thee a mischief for cruelty's sake, but he is minded to get what he can out of thee. If he use thee not for the pleasuring of his wife, so long as her pleasure in thee lasteth, he will verily use thee for somewhat else. And to speak plainly, I now deem that he will make thee my mate, to use with me, or against me, as occasion may serve. So thou shalt be another captain of this host. He laughed withal, and said again, But if thou be not wary, thou wilt tumble off that giddy height, and find thyself a thrall once more, and maybe a gelding to boot. Now waxed Ralph angry, and forgot his prudence, and said, Yea, but how shall he use me when I am out of reach of his hand? Oh, ho, young man, said Otter, whither away, then, to be out of his reach? Why, quoth Ralph, still angrily, is thy lord master of all the world? Nay, said the captain, but of a piece thereof. In short, betwixt Utterbol and Goldberg, and Utterbol and the mountains, and Utterbol and an hundred miles north, and an hundred miles south, there is no place where thou canst live, no place save the howling wilderness, and scarcely there either, where he may not lay hand on thee, if he do but whistle. What, man, be not downhearted. Come with us to Utterbol, since thou needst must. Be wise, and then the Lord shall have no occasion against thee. Above all, beware of crossing him in any matter of a woman." Then who knows? And here he sunk his voice well nigh to a whisper. But thou and I, together, may rule in Utterbol, and make better days there. 
Ralph was waxen master of himself by now, and was gotten wary indeed, so he made as if he liked Otter's counsel well, and became exceeding gay, for indeed the heart within him was verily glad at the thought of his escaping from thraldom, for more than ever now he was fast in his mind to flee at the time appointed by Redhead. So Otter said, Well, youngling, I am glad that thou takest it thus, for I deem that if thou wert to seek to depart, the Lord would make it an occasion against thee. Such an occasion shall he not have, fellow in arms, quoth Ralph. But tell me, we ride presently, and I suppose are bound for utterness by the shortest road? Yea, said Otter, and anon we shall come to the great forest which lieth along our road all the way to utterness and beyond it. For the town is, as it were, an island in the sea of woodland which covers all, right up to the feet of the great mountains, and does what it may to climb them, whereso the great wall or its buttresses are anywise broken down toward our country. But the end of it lieth along our road, as I said, and we do but skirt it. A woeful wood it is, and save for the hunting of the beasts, which be there in great plenty, with wolves and bears, yea, and lions to boot, which come down from the mountains, there is no gain in it, no gain, though forsooth they say that some have found it gainful. How so? said Ralph. Said Otter, That way lieth the way to the well at the world's end, if one might find it. If at any time we were clear of Utterbol, I have a mind for the adventure along with thee, lad, and so I deem hast thou from all the questions thou hast put to me thereabout. Ralph mastered himself, so that his face changed not, and he said, Well, Captain, that may come to pass, but tell me, are there any tokens known whereby a man shall know that he is on the right path to the well? The report of folk goeth, said Otter, concerning one token, where is the road and the pass through the great mountains, to wit, that on the black rock thereby is carven the image of a fighting man, or monstrous giant, of the days long gone by. Of other signs I can tell thee not, and few of men are alive that can. But there is a sage dwelleth in the wood under the mountains, to whom folk seek for his diverse lore. And he, if he will, say men, can set forth all the way and its perils and how to escape them. Well, knight, when the time comes, thou and I will go find him together, for he at least is not so hard to find, and if he be gracious to us, then will we on our quest. But as now, see ye, they have struck our tents, and the queen's pavilion also, so to horse is the word. Yea, quoth Ralph, looking curiously toward the place where the queen's pavilion had stood. Is not yonder the queen's litter taking the road? "'Yea, surely,' said Otter. "'Then the litter will be empty,' said Ralph. "'Maybe, or maybe not,' said Otter. "'But now I must get me gone hastily to my folk. "'Doubtless we shall meet upon the road to Utterbol.' "'So he turned and went his ways, "'and Ralph also ran to his horse, "'whereby was David already in the saddle, "'and so mounted, and the whole route moved slowly "'from out of Vale Taurus, Ralph going ever by David.' The company was now a great one, for many wains were joined to them, laden with meals and fleeces and other household stuff, and withal there was a great herd of meat and of sheep and of goats, which the Lord's men had been gathering in the fruitful country these two days. But the Lord was still tarrying in the tower. End of chapter 39《ハッピーバーガーの話は、Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela. The Well at the World's End. Book 2 by William Morris. Chapter 40. They Ride Toward Utterness from Out of Vale Turris. So they rode by a good highway, well beaten past the tower and over the ridge of the valley, and came full upon the terrible sight of the great mountains. And the sea of woodland lay before them, swelling and falling and swelling again, till it broke gray against the dark blue of the mountain wall. They went as the way led, downhill, when they were at the bottom, thence along their highway parted the tillage and fenced pastures from the rough edges of the woodland, like as a ditch sunders field from field. They had the wild wood ever on their right hand, and but a little way from where they rode, the wood thickened for the more part into dark and closed thicket. The trees whereof were so tall that they hid the overshadowing mountains, when so they rode the bottoms. But when the way mounted on the ridges, and the trees gave back a little, they had sight of the woodland and the mountains. On the other hand, at whiles, the thicket came close up to the roadside. Now David biddeth press on past the wains and the driven beasts, which were going very slowly. 
So did they, and at last were well nigh at the head of the Lord's company. But when Ralph would have pressed on still, David refrained him, and said that they must by no means outgo the Queen's people, or even mingle with them. So they rode on softly. But as the afternoon was drawing toward evening, they heard great noise of horns behind them, and the sound of horses galloping. Then David drew Ralph to the side of the way, and everybody about, both before and behind them, drew up in wise at the wayside. And or ever Ralph could ask any question, came a band of men-at-arms at the gallop led by Otter, and after them the lord on his black steed. And beside him on a white palfrey, the woman whom Ralph had seen in the tower, and whom he had taken for the queen, her light raiment streaming out from her, and her yellow hair flying loose. They passed in moment of time, and then David and Ralph and the rest rode on after them. Then said Ralph, The queen rideth well and heartily. Yea, said David, screwing his face into a grin, would he or no? Ralph beheld him, and it came into his mind that this was not the queen whom he had looked on when they first came into Vale Taurus, and he said, What then? This woman is not the queen. David spake not for a while, and then he answered, Sir Knight, there be matters whereof we servants of my lord say little or nothing, and thou wert best to do the like, and no more would he say thereon. End of chapter 40 Recording by Joe Sela. Chapter 41 of The Well at the World's End, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 2, by William Morris. Chapter 41 Redhead Keeps Tryst. They rode not above a dozen miles that day, and pitched their tents and pavilions in the fair meadows by the wayside, looking into the thick of the forest. There this betid to tell of, that when Ralph got off his horse, and the horse-lads were gathered about the men-at-arms and high folk, who should take Ralph's horse but Redhead, who made a sign to him by lifting his eyebrows as if he were asking him somewhat and Ralph took it as a question as to whether his purpose held to flee on the morrow night. So he nodded a yea-say, just so much as Redhead might note it, and naught else befell betwixt them. When it was barely dawn after that night, Ralph awoke with the sound of great stir in the camp, and shouting of men, and lowing and bleating of the beasts. So he looked out, and saw that the wains and the flocks and the herds were being got on to the road, so that they might make good way before the company of the camp took to the road. But he heeded it little, and went to sleep again. When it was fully morning he arose, and found that the men were not hastening their departure, but were resting by the woodside, and disporting them about the meadow. So he wandered about amongst the men-at-arms and serving-men, and came across Redhead, and hailed him. And there was no man very nigh to them. So Redhead looked about him warily, and then spake swiftly and softly. Fail not to-night, fail not, for yesterday again was I told by one who wotteth surely, what abideth thee at Utterbol, if thou go thither. I say if thou fail, thou shalt repent but once, all thy life long. To wit. Ralph nodded his head, and said, Fear not, I will not fail thee. And therewith they turned away from each other, lest they should be noted. About two hours before noon they got to horse again, and being no more encumbered with the wains and the beasts, rode at a good pace. As on the day before, the road led them along the edge of the wildwood, and whiles it even went close to the very thicket, whiles again they mounted somewhat and looked down on the thicket, leagues and leagues thereof, which yet seemed but a little space because of the hugeness of the mountain wall which brooded over it, but oftenest the forest hid all but the near trees. Thus they rode some twenty miles, and made stay at sunset in a place that seemed rather a clearing of the wood than a meadow, for they had trees on their left at a furlong's distance, as well as on their right at a stone's throw. Ralph saw not Redhead as he got off his horse, and David, according to his wont, went with him to his tent. 
but after they had supped together, and David had made much of Ralph, and had drank many cups to his health, he said to him, The night is yet young, yea, but new-born, yet must I depart from thee, if I may, to meet a man who will sell me a noble horse good cheap, and I may as well leave thee now, seeing that thou hast become a free man. So I bid thee good night. Therewith he departed, and was scarce gone out, ere Redhead cometh in, and saith in his wonted rough loud voice, Here, knight, here is the bridle, thou badest me get mended. Will the coblin serve? Then seeing no one there, he fell to speaking softer, and said, I heard the old pimp call thee a free man e'en now. I fear me that thou art not so free as he would have thee think. Anyhow, were I thou, I would be freer in two hours' space. Is it to be so? Yea, yea, said Ralph. Redhead nodded. Good is that, said he. I say, in two hours' time all will be quiet, and we are as near the thicket as may be. There is no moon, but the night is fair, and the stars clear. So all that thou hast to do is to walk out of this tent, and turn at once to thy right hand. Come out with me now quietly, and I will show thee. They went out together, and Redhead said softly, Lo thou that dotted oak yonder, like a piece of hayrick it looks under the stars. If thou seest it, come in again at once. Ralph turned and drew Redhead in, and said when they were in the tent again, Yea, I saw it. What then? Said Redhead, I shall be behind it abiding thee. Must I go afoot? said Ralph. Or how shall I get me a horse? I have a horse for thee, said Redhead. Not thine own, but a better one yet, that hath not been back to-day. Now give me a cup of wine, and let me go. Ralph filled for him, and took a cup himself, and said, I pledge thee, my friend, and wish thee better luck, and I would have thee for my fellow in this quest. Nay, said Redhead, it may not be. I will not burden thy luck with my ill luck, and moreover, I am seeking something which I may gain at Utterbol, and if I have it, I may do my best to say good night to that evil abode. Yea, said Ralph, and I wish thee well therein, said Redhead, stammering somewhat. It is even that woman of the Queen's, whereof I told thee. And now, one last word, since I must not be over long in thy tent, lest someone come upon us. But, fair sir, if thy mind misgive thee, for this turning aside from Utterbol, Though it is not to be doubted that the damsel whom thou seekest hath been there, it is not also sure that thou wouldst have found her there. For of late, what with my lord and lady being both away, the place hath been scant of folk, and not only is the said damsel wise and wary, but there be others who have seen her besides my lord, and whoso hath seen her is like to love her and such is she that whoso loveth her is like to do her will. So I bid thee, in all case be earnest in thy quest, and think that if thou die on the road, thy damsel would have died for thee, and if thou drink of the well, and come back whole and safe, I know not why thou shouldest not go straight to Utterbol, and have the damsel away with thee, whosoever gainsay it. For they, if there be any such, who have drunk of the well at the world's end, are well looked to in this land. Now one more word yet. When I come to Utterbol, if the damsel be there still, fear not, but I will have speech of her, and tell of thee, and what thou wert looking to, and how thou deemest of her. Therewith he turned, and departed hastily. But Ralph, left alone, was sorely moved with hope and fear, and a longing that grew in him to see the damsel. 
for though he was firmly set on departure and on seeking the sage aforesaid yet his heart was drawn this way and that and it came into his mind how the damsel would fare when the evil lord came home to utterbol and he could not choose but make stories of her meeting of the tyrant and her fear and grief and shame and the despair of her heart so the minutes went slow to him till he should be in some new place and doing somewhat toward bringing about the deliverance of her from thraldom and the meeting of him and her end of chapter 41 end of the well at the world's end book 2 by william morris